uh, good evening, California Democrats. It's great to be here with you this evening. Uh, my name is Rusty Hicks. I'm the chair of the California Democratic Party. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us uh, this evening for this important conversation, Black Women Lead, as we celebrate Black History Month. I want to begin by uh, taking a moment to thank our outstanding speakers, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Kathy Blumenfield, founder of Alicio, a leadership development organization building inspired leadership for a thriving people and planet. Our new Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, our DNC Chairman, Jamie Harrison, our Assembly Member, Sidney Kamlager, and I believe future uh, California State Senator, a DNC Member and Women's Caucus Vice Chair, Carolyn Fowler, uh, and our CDP Black Caucus Chair, Taisha Brown. I also wanna take a moment to thank our party's statewide officers for joining us uh, here today. Our Vice Chair, Daraka Laramore Hall, Vice Chair, Alex Rooker, uh, our Secretary, Jenny Bach, along with our Controller, Dan Weitzman. We also wanna take a moment to acknowledge our ASL interpreters and those that are providing our closed captioning. We're grateful for their contribution to this evening's uh, event. This evening uh, and every day, California Democrats are proud to join the rest of the country as we reflect on the profound role that Black Americans have had in shaping our nation. We reflect and honor the leaders and activists who for centuries have sought to hold us true to our democratic values that value that says that all people are created equal. And although there has been progress, 2020 underlined the systemic inequities that black Americans continue to face. From the pandemic, which disproportionately impacts black Americans to the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey that sparked the entire world to march as one, to march together for peace. To the desecration of the very seat of democracy, our US Capitol incited by a now twice impeached president. Simply put, we must do more. The last four years have cast a shadow on the progress that we've made, but it's also brought us to a place of healing together, a place where we can rebuild a nation that's brighter for every American. This year, we celebrated our first Black American woman, Madam, our very own Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. And we cheered on the appointment of Dr. Shirley Weber as California's first Black woman to serve as Secretary of State. California Democrats understand that greater diversity at the tables where decisions are made benefit the 40 million Californians that call the Golden State home. That's why today I'm thrilled to be joined by all of you, uh, hear from, learn from, and to honor leading black women who have broken glass ceilings and forged political paths in fighting for justice and equality. So before we get started, we have a few democratic leaders and activists who would like to share with you what Black History Month means to them. Thank you for being. It's truly a time to honor and celebrate the countless African Americans who were trailblazers for justice and pioneers for change. I've been thinking and reading and studying a lot about the black pioneers and troublemakers who have made it possible for people like me to be in the Democratic Party. To acknowledge the contribution of the African American people that has been omitted from the history books, from education, and from mainstream American knowledge. And it means the world, not just to black people, but also to other people who just don't know the history because it wasn't taught. Every February, I take time to think on the work and sacrifices of countless generations of folks whose names we'll never know. This is a time to slow down, think about it. What have African-Americans done for this country? 
we are the bedrock of the United States. And so for one month, we slow ourselves down, we look at the contributions, and we think next steps. My sisters in the movement who blazed a trail for us, like Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, Shirley Chisholm, Sandy Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, Katherine Johnson, and Barbara Jordan. Women like them who voted and fought for a better future for our country every day, leading up to the election of the first woman vice president, Kamala Harris. We must ensure that black women don't just carry Democrats to victory, but lead us. Someone like Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the confrontation that they had with the power structure of this party and this country in demanding not just a seat at the table, but the ability to shape the Democratic Party's platform policies and to really participate fully in democratic life. And very often these voices were met with chastisement, with being told that they were a little too loud or a little too early. And I wanna thank everyone who came before me uh, who didn't listen to that advice. We still must do good trouble as my hero, John Lewis, demonstrate over and over again. Activism has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. My mentor, the Honorable Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress and the first African-American woman to run for president. Well, she encouraged me to get up and get involved when I met her for the first time in Mills College, my alma mater, and that was during her run for the presidency. The California Democratic Party is shaped by the heroes and sheroes living black history, past and present. One who I've been thinking about a lot lately is our friend Darren Parker, the past chair of the CDP African American Caucus, or as we mutually called each other, Mr. Chairman. I'll never forget our last conversation. I was out on the campaign trail and he called me from a chemo session. Mr. Chairman, I miss you. And I, in this year, in this February, I recommit myself, my Rosa resolution is in your name. People like Carol Mosley Braun and Shirley Chisholm, they were running for offices at a office at a time when black women weren't running for those seats in great numbers. Current uh, leaders, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, Congress members Maxine Waters, Karen Bass, Barbara Lee, all of them inspire me. The time that we commit to the work of lifting up the black community and rededicating ourselves as a nation to overcoming white supremacy and the systemic racism that continues to impact African Americans each and every single day. The civil rights movement showed me where I came from. I was both fascinated and terrified by what, what I saw. Well-dressed black people sang, marched, and protested for their rights to be treated equal in response to people being beaten, churches getting bombed, little girls dying, and MLK being assassinated. I learned that black people had to fight and die for the freedoms that I now have. And that's why I continue to fight for black people and for all people. My union had an unlocked door policy in the 70s. However, that door was blocked by someone on the inside with their foot against it. In 2010, that door was blown open when I became the first black president of that local. That revitalized my activism. Our current history should revitalize yours. I am the first African-American woman to lead the Democratic Party of Sacramento County, our state capital. As our Forever Floaters, First Lady Michelle Obama stated, there's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard, in owning your unique story, in using your authentic voice, and there's grace in being willing to know and hear others. To the next steps, we're proactive, even though we have been beaten down in so many ways, under so many circumstances. But as Maya Angelou says, as still I rise. And let's keep the ball rolling. Happy Black History Month.
Happy Black History Month, Democrats. All right, all right, all right. That, that was such a beautiful video. Um, so many beautiful voices um, that we're able to hear who, are, who reflect our party um, all across the state. And I want to say, you know, just uh, echo Sean Dugar when he gave a, um, a shout out to um, our past chair, um, Daryl Parker, who I also um, missed out of the moment when he said his name here and again. Um, and also, we're here to celebrate um, Black women leadership and talk about it within the party. Um, you know, next to my mother, my grandmother, a number of strong Black women in my personal family, um, I think of Kathy Bloomingfield, who was a, a former boss of mine when she was running the Liberty Hill Foundation. And I was at the pleasure of working with her on a number of exciting um, projects. And now, today she'll be moderating a conversation with us. I want to tell you a little bit more about her. She's the, on the board of the Jane Irvine Foundation, the Tides Foundation, and the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands. Um, she is the founder of Elysio, which is an organization that's going to be, that is, that is training people to be stronger, ethical, powerful, and more holistic leaders. Um, but tonight she'll be leading conversation uh, with a few other of our amazing Black women leaders. And without further ado, I want to pass it over to Kathy Bloomingfield. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was really moved by that video and I'm moved by the outstanding black leadership up and down this state. Um, I am thrilled to be with you all. Um, I am very thankful. We have three um, inspiring, uh, smart, talented and committed elected leaders who are gonna share with us this evening uh, their leadership journey. And um, as we have this conversation, on top of mind is that there are zero black women in the US Senate out of the 100 members, zero black women in the state Senate today out of the 40 members, two black women in the state assembly out of the 80 members. And, and researchers have concluded over and over again that diversity leads to excellence. When we have different genders, sexual orientations and ethnicities in our workplace, diverse thought, the outcomes are just better. And this remains true in, 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 in governance. When we elect leaders who have lived experiences that result in their steadfast commitment to reimagining our society to create a more just, equitable and sustainable world, everyone benefits. The leadership of Black women matters not only for African Americans, but all of America. Our three outstanding panelists demonstrate this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, but I'm also going to share with you their uh, websites because they all have beautiful stories. And I think you would appreciate hearing the detailed stories of their, of their journeys from their bios on their website. Congressman Barbara Lee is now in her 12th congressional term. Uh, the Congresswoman has served since 1998. Uh, Congresswoman serves as co-chair of the Policy and Steering Committee. And she is the first black member of Congress to chair the House Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. Lee has played a major role in uh, the anti-war movement, uh, the fight to end AIDS and more. Um, please see her bio at lee.house.gov. And the Congresswoman will be joining us in just a little bit. And we uh, look forward to uh, having her as part of uh, this conversation. California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber um, was first elected to the California State Assembly in 2012. And uh, in December 2020, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, nominated then Assembly Member Weber to succeed Alex Padilla as Secretary of State. Weber is the first African American person to serve as California's Secretary of State and the fifth to serve in a statewide position. Please see Secretary of State uh, Dr. Weber's full bio at sos.ca.gov and uh, thrilled to be able to welcome her. 
Now we're going to start off um, with uh, someone uh, just down down the way from me here in Southern California, here in Los Angeles. Assembly member Sydney Conlager represents the 54th Assembly District. In 2020, uh, uh, Sydney passed AB 1950, the most transformative probation reform legislation in the country. As chair of the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women, uh, uh, Sydney is focused on reforming policies to support the health, dignity, and rehabilitation of women in prison. The assembly member is also committed to advocating for environmental justice, funding for the arts and equity in our education system. Please see her full bio. It's at a54.asmdc.org. And Sydney, uh, assembly member Kamlager, welcome. I am so thrilled that we get to start off um, uh, this, this conversation um, together. Thank so you. There good to you, see you It's been a while. It's so good to see you. Just great, great as always. So let's just start this out. And um, uh, what I'm going to say is, I, you know, when when the other leaders join us, I'm going to have questions for all three of you. But I'm going to say this, and and we know each other well enough. If I ask someone else a question that you prefer to answer or just interests you more, I just encourage you to say, "Hey, Kathy." hold up, I actually wanna talk about this. Um, because this is not just an opportunity to, um, you know, ask you any question or any, any questions. This is an opportunity for us to really hear what's on your mind today during this, as we keep saying, unprecedented time. So I extend that invitation and interrupt me at, at any point. And it looks as if Dr. Weber is going to come on in just in just a second. So Sydney, let's just start us out. Um, could, could you can you just t talk to us? Tell us how important your background experiences and perspective as a black woman, as a black woman, are in shaping the decisions that you make in the legislature. You know, it absolutely informs every single way in which I consider uh, legislation. If you're thinking about education, environmental justice, transportation, funding for childcare, criminal justice reform, I am obviously always thinking about those issues through the lens of my district, but inherently I'm thinking about all of the types of black women that I know um, and how would this particular bill or this particular budget line item impact uh, their livelihood, right? Impact their ability to thrive and survive in California. And I just fundamentally believe that if that woman is going to do better because of a particular bill, then every single other Californian by default is going to do better at least because of that bill. That's that's right. You know, let's take a step back actually. Um, can you just tell everyone a little bit about your district? And the reason why I would love for you to do that is because sometimes people assume that your district um, uh, is, of, of, is of one demographic or another demographic. And I think that your statement um, is, is important particularly for your district. So can you just share with folks a little bit about your district? Yeah, you know, I, I love the 54th. I think it's a microcosm of the state. Um, it goes from, you know, Slauson to the south, to UCLA in the 405 to the west, to the 10 Olympic Pico, um, you know, to the north and western on the east. Um, it is very diverse. Uh, black folks, brown folks, a little bit of Asian folks, white folks. We have immense wealth, you know, Homely Hills, Century City, Cheviot Hills, and we have some real deep poverty, you know, portions of South LA. Um, and not everyone thinks the exact same way about every issue. Now, I think their outcomes are generally the same. Everyone in the district wants the same thing, but the journey um, is very different for some communities than the destination. And some communities feel like 
you're always giving me the sunshine, you know, state of California. And other communities feel like I never see any daylight, state of California. And so my job is to thread the needle so that those folks who feel like they're underrepresented, um, not always counted, not always seen, you know, I need them to know that I do see them. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really thrilled. Um, Sydney, we've been joined by uh, 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 Dr. Weber, uh, Representative Lee. Uh, welcome. Um, we're just thrilled to have you both here. Um, we sh I shared your bios at the very, very beginning. And I said to the assembly member that I have some questions uh, that I plan on asking you, um, ones that we may have developed together. But if at any time I ask a question of someone else and you actually want to talk about that question rather than one I asked you, please feel free to interrupt and say, hey, Kathy, uh, I want to get to something else. Let, you know, I'm going to now move. Um, welcome, uh, uh, Congresswoman Lee. Um, you, you once talked about how you would not be Congresswoman Barbara Lee without Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first Black woman elected to Congress, nor would it be possible for the first Black woman to serve as Vice President of the United States, nor would we have elected the first Black man to serve as President of the United States. Would you share your story of how when you were a BSU student, when you first met Congresswoman Chisholm and she said to you, little girl, you can't change the system if you're outside looking in. How did that meeting guide you in your work? <sighs> what would you say to her now? Well, thanks so much, Kathy. I'm glad to be with you, Dr. Weber, Amy, uh, Sydney, excuse me, and uh, all of you, Taisha. Where, where's Taisha? She's somewhere. And thanks so much to our uh, Democratic um, Black, our Black Caucus of the Democratic Party, because you all are awesome and doing such wonderful work. So active, helping to change um, the political landscape in California. And so for for the better in terms of racial equity and justice for African Americans. But let me tell you, uh, it, it's Shirley Ch I was a student in Mills College. Uh, the context was I was a community worker with the Black Panther Party. I was very clear on politics and I didn't want to be a Democrat or a Republican because I didn't think the two party system made a difference in my life. I mean, it was like I was on welfare, raising two little kids as a single mother. It was like McGovern, Muskie, Humphrey then were running. I said, what the heck? No way. So I was very conscious as a young woman, but uh, very adamant about not registering to vote. I had a class in government and part of my government at Mills College, part of my government um, requirement, government class requirement was to do field work in a presidential campaign. McGovern, Muskie, Humphrey, I said, no way, I'm not working in any of their campaigns. I told my professor, flunk me. I've never flunked a class before, but flunk me. Same time, I was Black Student Union president, mind you. So I'm studying, raising kids, Black Student Union president, community worker with the Black Panther Party, among what I was doing. So I invited Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm to speak to the Black Student Union at Mills College. And Shirley came, you know, and I invited her as the first African-American woman elected to Congress. I knew who she was, but never did I know she was running for president. So she came and she spoke, and let me tell you, she spoke fluent Spanish, first of all. A lot of people don't know that. She talked about immigrant rights. She talked about education. She was a, uh, an educator. She talked about poverty, eliminating poverty. She talked, she was against the Vietnam War. She, everything that I thought these other guys weren't even speaking to. And then she said she was ready for president. Well, I was like amazed. So I went up and talked to her and told her about my class that I was about to flunk and said, well, after listening to her, maybe I'd reconsider uh, flunking and uh, maybe I'd work in her campaign class, but I really liked her and what she had to say. And she took me to task. She took her finger at me. And even to this day, when before she passed away, she still called me little girl. And I was here there with my two little kids, right? So she said, little girl, if you really want to shake things up and be, uh, and be part of this transformation, and if you really believe in what you say, then you have to get on the inside and you've got to fight hard and you've got to register to vote. I said, no, 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 not me. I'm a revolutionary. I don't do that, but I'll help you in your campaign. And so I said, what do I do and how do I find people? So she kept telling me I had to register to vote. And then she said, well, I'd love you to work in my campaign but I don't have a lot of national money. I have no idea who's doing what, and I'm leaving, leaving it to my local communities to organize. So I went back to my class, told my professor uh, that I'd now reconsider flunking this class. And this is the got truth. I would reconsider it because I met the candidate I could work for. What do I do? She said, that's for you to figure out. That's part of the coursework. 
assholes know. So I, <laughs> I literally had to organize my the Cal, Northern California pres, Shirley Chisholm presidential primary out of my class at Mills College. Sandy Gaines was the a student body president, African American woman. Sandre Swanson, my former chief of staff, was student body president at Laney College, and Wilson Riles Jr. was a, a student at Laney. And so we all got together. We organized my class, organized her campaign out of my class at Mills College. I got uh, an A in the class, and I went on to Miami as a Shirley Chisholm delegate, and the rest is history. <laughs> if you read her book, The Good Fight, read The Last Primary, Chapter 6. She writes all about this in her book. <laughs> So that's kind of, and from there, the rest is history. I never worked for her formally, but I worked for our beloved Ron Dellums uh, in Washington. And she mentored me and she t gave, told me how, <laughs> she said, you see what I, and she was the only black woman in Congress, the only one for a long time. And what do she you said, think she, what do you think she'd say to you now? She would say to me, <laughs> be yourself, keep fighting. And she would say, and she told me this then, and I know she'd say this now. When you get on the inside, don't go along to get along. These rules weren't made for you or me. Nobody looked like me made these rules. You got to get in there and shake things up. Don't go along to get along. Change them. And that's what she did. You know, she said, we got to have systemic change and you got to change the rules of the game. And I know she would keep telling us that. And, uh, and you know, she was remarkable to look back now and see how she did this by herself. Uh, it's just uh, incredible. And so we all owe Shirley Chisholm a debt of gratitude. And it's because of Shirley Chisholm that I am, and it's because of Shirley Chisholm that Kamala Harris is. Thank you, thank you so much. So, so many more questions um, that, I, that I hope we can get to. Um, Secretary of State, Dr. Weber, you know, I, um, I was really taken by your, your story. You know, e each of you has a very powerful origin story. You know, when, when folks see you, they may just see the title, right? And, and the, the responsibility and the power that comes with that title. And yet there is a human uh, uh, a story with each of you. Um, and reflecting on, on your years of leadership, Dr. Weber, you once noted uh, your leadership wasn't part of your life plan. It was just a result of working hard that people thought maybe this woman could do it. Would you tell us briefly the story that led to your becoming the leader you are now, starting out as a daughter of sharecroppers, and what you wish you knew at the beginning of your leadership journey that you know now? We can't hear you. I, I'm mute. There we, um, there we go. Well, thanks so very much for, for, for this uh, event, and thanks to Ta Taisha and Carolyn and all of you who work so hard in the Democratic Party to make this possible. And, uh, you know, great, great uh, honor to be here with Barbara Lee and, 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 and know the battles that she's been through and, 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 uh, and how she stands so strong sometimes by herself. Uh, but nonetheless, she stands, and that, and that in itself is an encouragement and an inspiration. You know, I had, um, um, my father was a sharecropper and most folks know that how with sharecropping systems there are in Arkansas that you never get out of sharecropping with any profit. You know, the system is designed, it's a second class citizen, it's a, it's a, it's a step below slavery. And, uh, and so no matter how hard you work from year to year, you will always owe these white folks some money. And my family was one that owned land and but was never allowed to operate its own land unless it operated white folks land first. And so my father hated being a sharecropper, but he nonetheless, he was married and had a family and his brothers and sisters were there. Uh, but he always fought back. He never said yes, sir, no, sir, to any of them. So they all thought, always thought he was one of them crazy ends. And they just kind of tolerated him in the community. Um, but he fought back. And so at one point, I guess he'd had enough. He went to the way station and um, uh, they told him that he hadn't made enough that year to break even. And so he was still in debt to them at the store. And my daddy argued that he was not, they fought back, there was a physical confrontation and white folks decided that he was a liability. That as long as he was in that community, somebody else might think the same way. And so they made a plan to, uh, to basically uh, eliminate my father. And uh, so the word got around the community that that's what they were gonna do. And so his brothers and his father put him in a wagon and took him to, from Hope to Texarkana. 
and put him on a train to my grandmother who lived in Los Angeles. My mother's mother lived in Los Angeles. And, uh, and uh, so he came to Los Angeles, barely able to read, took the train, uh, courageous, I mean, to that extent, to be able to travel that distance and, and, and only know that you were going to Los Angeles and getting off at the end of the train stop and to meet my uncle and my, and my mother, my mother's mother there at the train station. And um, uh, I don't know if he'd ever seen my uncle before because my uncle had been in the war. And so as a result, uh, he came to California and worked very hard for four months and basically brought the rest of us to California by train in 1951, December 1st, 1951. And, um, but my father always believed very strongly that, um, that the thing that he missed most in life, two things. One was uh, the education. He felt that it limited his existence. It limited his ability to argue his case and to make his point. And as a result of that, he worked very hard in the steel mills of Los Angeles and in, 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 in commerce. Uh, but he always insisted that his eight children go to school, that we had to go to school, that we had to do well, because that's one of the things he says, when you get it, white folks can't take it from you. And they can take anything else, he said, but they can't take your education. And he drilled that into his eight children. The other thing he felt very strongly about was voting. You know, uh, he, he never was allowed to vote in Hope, Arkansas. My grandparents in Hope, Arkansas uh, died before 1965, so they never got a chance to register and to vote. And uh, the one of the first things he did in coming to California was he registered to vote. So he did his first election in 1952 and voted every election since. Because he said, if you don't vote, then uh, you may amass wealth, but white folks can take it from you by making up laws and rules that keep you from basically keeping your stuff. He saw that every day in folks stealing land in Arkansas and going to court and, and making rules and changing regulations and things that you could lose it. So he said, you have to vote. So my father was, and my mother were avid voters, uh, so avid that, that our house was a voting uh, poll in Los Angeles. Uh, our house, the living room, 351 West 45th Street was where people came to actually vote in our living room. Not in the garage, my daddy said, because it was too important to be in the garage. It had to be in the living room. So he moved out all the furniture, every election, every primary, every special election, it didn't matter what it was, they voted in our living room. So as a kid, I grew up with this idea of one, that you had to go to school, that it was extremely important, that if you didn't go to school, white folks, you know, that you would not be able to defend yourself. And second, that whatever you got, you needed to vote because you needed to basically def defend your right and, and maintain your things. We lived in the projects at one point in the Pueblos, they just built the Pueblos. And I remember my father, there were a number of, my father worked every day, but there were a number of folks who were on social services, on welfare. And my dad could never believe why people on welfare would not vote. He could, he would talk to the people. He said, are you crazy? He said, do you know your whole life is dependent on the government and you're not even voting? I mean, he was just, livid about people not going to vote. He said, especially those on welfare. He said, if you voted, you could get more money in welfare. He just, he just could not understand how people so dependent on the government would never go vote. And so as a result of that, he, you know, every child he had, whenever we got of age, we had to register to vote. My father would check every election to make sure we all went to vote. Every grandkid had to register to vote. So we all had to register to vote because it was just that powerful. And we learned very early that that was a significant piece, no matter what, how radical we were and how we talked about all kinds of things. And I was at UCLA and one thing or another, my dad said, that's all fine and good, but you got to go vote. Go vote some of them radical people in office. That's what he was saying. You want to be some radical people, go find you some and vote them in office, but don't stand around here complaining about them if you don't vote. And, and so- ironic for me that I tell people that after all of these years of, of that, I never perceived of myself as an assembly member. I wanted to be a teacher, an educator, and I was, but I also knew that I had to be an activist in my community and take whatever I had, the education I had, because so many people gave me so much that I had to give back to them. You know, my community gave me stuff. My church helped me, all these folks. And so I was, I was an activist as my family was forever. And so I did not plan to run for anything. I have never volunteered for any position or volunteered to run for anything. I'm telling you the truth. I, when I was on the school board, uh, they had to come find me. I said, no, let's find somebody else. And they, and they sat around months and called me and now, are you ready to run? I said, did y'all find somebody? No, we already found you, that's it. And so I was like, it's, we always tell us you have to be an activist, blah, 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 so forth and so on. And everybody's got to step up, so. That's right, and and uh, and thank you for stepping up, and and you know um, all of California is your living room now, 
And evidently, uh, evidently. everybody's in my living room. We are all in your living room. Oh, and oh, yeah. that's right. That's right. I'd love to do some rapid fire questions. Okay. Uh, I have so many questions for you all, but I, rapid fire question. First for you, um, uh, Representative Lee, because I know you have to leave in a moment here. Um, black women uh, leaders were key in the black power um, movement in the in the 60s. Uh, you know, we had positions in the Black Panther Party. Um, what advice would you give to today's black women who have found their voices during the Black Lives Matter movement? Continue to lead, continue to be yourselves. Remember that uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, and we're black women and still we rise. Thank you so much. Assemblymember Kamlager, what advice do you have for up and coming black women who, uh, you know, maybe just like Dr. Weber said, maybe they're not thinking about running. What advice do you have for them to hear the call? Keep your ears and your heart and your minds open. Most of the folks who run are not thinking about running. Only the men wake up thinking about running. Women wake up thinking about how to fix things and solve problems. So don't underrate yourself and don't close yourself off to the angels who are coming to you saying, your voice is the voice we need right now and run. Mm, thank you so much. Dr. Weber, you mentioned that, you know, you have a lot of young folks who come to you and ask you, you know, what is it to get to your level? How do you do that? Really quickly, what advice do you have for these young people? Be honest, be true to yourself and be strong and, um, and take your time because most folks look at the rest of us and, and, and don't realize how long we've been in this struggle. We think it's instant. And, uh, and I tell people what you see is a result of 50 years of struggle, 50 years of working in community and it takes time and you will not be an instant success. And everybody is gonna put in their time, but do your time and keep the work good and hard and it will happen for you. Indeed. I tell you, um, I wanted to ask you all what gives you hope for this year, but I'll tell you what gives me hope for this year are Black women leaders such as yourselves. As we all see in the critical work that you all are leading, there is no American history without Black history. So please, everyone, join me in thanking our elected leaders on this panel and all the change makers who are listening who are doing change in their districts, in their neighborhoods, who are making Black history 365 days per year. So thank you all. Thank you. I, I am pleased now to introduce Carolyn Fowler, a DNC member, the vice chair of CAD Dams Women Caucus, as a member of A Way Forward, the California Democratic Party's working group to evaluate CADEM's progress in implementing a code of conduct. Carolyn is recommending improved processes for reporting, investigating, and disciplining sexual and racial harassment and related misconduct. Carolyn is the mother of a daughter who's also an active Democrat. We are delighted to have Carolyn Fowler with us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. It is my indeed honor uh, at this time to introduce uh, one of my favorite people in the world right now, uh, Jamie Harrison, who currently serves as the chair of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, as the son of a single teenage mom, Jamie was raised by his grandparents in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Jamie knows what it's like uh, for a family to have to choose between paying the electric bill and putting food on the table, and also what it feels like to sleep in a home with no heat because the power was shut off. But thanks to good public school education and the love of his family, he was able to, and the community, he was able to earn a scholarship to Yale University and attend Georgetown Law. After college, Jamie came back home to Orangeburg to teach at his old high school. And just a point of personal privilege, he taught ninth grade social studies, my favorite subject. We love our teachers here in the California, Mr. Chair, so you're more than welcome to be here. 
He then worked to help empower disadvantaged kids to attend college. Jamie also served as an aide to the legendary, and you all know him and love him so much, Congress member Jim Clyburn. In 2013, Jamie was elected as the first African-American chair of South Carolina Democratic Party, a position he held until 2017. When he was appointed by former DNC chair Tom Perez as an associate chair of the DNC, in 2020, Jamie ran for the U.S. Senate from South Carolina, and we all paid close attention to that, building a national grassroots movement and setting a fundraising record for the most raised by any Senate candidate. Jamie and his lovely wife, Marie, live in Columbia, South Carolina, where they raised their two sons. And please give a warm California welcome to DNC Chairman Jamie Harrison. Well, Vice Chair Fowler, thank you so much for that introduction. I can't wait to see you in person. Uh, I want to take you out to lunch and just thank you for your support, for your friendship, and for your leadership. And I also want to thank uh, Black Caucus Chair Brown for, for the invitation and special uh, acknowledgments to your State Party Chair Rusty Hicks and your Vice Chair Alex Gallardo Rooker and for their leadership. And I also want to congratulate Dr. Shirley Weber on becoming the first Black woman uh, to be California's Secretary of State. And I would be remiss if I didn't say something special about two women that are heroines uh, and, and just great friends of mine. They're also DNC members. Our uh, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who was just on the panel, and Congresswoman Maxine Waters. You know, I have so many friends in the California Democratic Party from our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, uh, her daughter who is over the Women's Caucus, uh, Christine Pelosi, and of course, our new Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. And this is the one thing that's gonna be interesting, my friends. When Joe Biden gives that State of the Union that's coming up, for the first time in history, when they pan to the back, and you will see the, in the seat of the president, uh, in the vice president, in the seat of the speaker of the house, you will have two women. And not only will there be two women, but two women from the great state of California. Uh, isn't that going to be amazing? And let me just say this. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you for the grit and resolve you have shown over the past year. As a former state party chair myself, I know you work where the rubber meets the road. And as the new DNC chair, I know that our success is intertwined. Our national party is only as strong as our state parties. Our national future is only as bright as your future. That's why the DNC invested and worked hand in hand with the California Democratic Party up and down the ballot in 2018 and 2020. We purchased nearly 9 million new cell phone numbers, hired constituency organizers, and trained grassroots volunteers. And these investments paid off. In 2020, President Biden and Vice President Harris earned 64% of the vote in California and flipped two counties, including one that hadn't gone Democratic since 1964. Democrats gained two seats in the state Senate. And despite our setback in the state assembly, Democrats have seen a net gain of five seats uh, in that assembly since 2016. But we still have work to do, my friends. We know that we still have work to do. And part of that work starts with elevating Black women. This is a unique Black History Month. And no, I don't just mean because we're meeting virtually these days. I mean because for the first time in our nation's history, a Black woman, California's very own Kamala Harris, is the Vice President of the United States. My friends, the gravity of that statement cannot be overstated. But we cannot let that victory turn into complacency. As Vice President Harris has said, she may be the first but she cannot and will not be the last. You've heard time and time again that Black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party, and that is true. Black women propelled Doug Jones to the Senate in Alabama in 2017. In Georgia, Black women laid the groundwork for President Biden and Vice President Harris's historic victory. And then again, two months later, when Georgia elected its first Jewish and first African-American senators in, this state, in the state's history, Black women who powered us to victory time and time and time again. 
So the progress Democrats made was not a coincidence. It wasn't dumb luck, and it certainly didn't happen overnight. It happened because Black women made it happen. At the DNC, we worked tireless, tirelessly to help organize and engage Black leaders and voters and to give them the resources they needed to turn out their communities. Together, we worked with you to launch critical engagement programs like Seat at the Table and Chop It Up. Together, we hosted African-American leadership summits across the country. Together, we expanded our voter protection outfit and fought back against voter suppression because we know the myth of voter fraud is nothing more than a Jim Crow tactic to silence communities of color. Together, we relaunched and revamped IWillVote.com, where voters could get state-specific information on registration deadlines, mail-in ballot instructions, and polling locations. It reached more than 20 million unique visitors last cycle. And the DNC Black Caucus, led by the one and only Ms. Virgie Rollins of Michigan, provided I Will Vote toolkits for Black voters in key battleground states. So yes, Black women are the backbone of our party, but they also, but they also must be the leaders of our party, not just in the White House, but at every level of government. That's why we need to keep encouraging and elevating Black women to run for office across the nation. My friends, I want you to hold me to this. I believe that 2022 will be the year of the Black woman in terms of elected office. So in both cities and rural towns and blue and red states, as we've seen before, Black women know what it takes to flip a state from red to blue. We need to give Black women candidates not just our words of support, but also the infrastructure and the investment to succeed. That means bolstering our voter protection efforts. It means organizing in rural communities because we know that rural areas are just as diverse as urban areas. It means learning from the successes of organizers like Stacey Abrams and maintaining a constant presence in communities, not just leading up to an election. Because the Democratic Party can't just be a political organization. We have to be a community organization addressing the needs of people across this country all the time not just during the election season. My friends, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but as we celebrate Black History Month, I'm confident we will succeed because every time I feel daunted by the task before us, I'm reminded of the heroines whose shoulders we stand on today. It wasn't too daunting for September Clark or Sarah Mae Fleming. It wasn't too daunting for Rosa Parks or Ru Ruby Bridge, Bridges. It wasn't too daunting for Ella Baker or Fannie Lou Hamer. It wasn't too daunting for Marsha Johnson or Katherine Johnson. It wasn't too daunting for Dorothy Hyatt or Polly Murray or Shirley Chisholm or Michelle Obama. It wasn't too daunting for Charlotta Bass or Kamala Harris. They faced the challenges before them head on with determination to make their country live up to its finding, founding ideals. And so must we. I'm proud to be in this fight alongside all of you, and I can't wait to see what we can accomplish together. Thank you, Chair Harrison. Um, I feel like I'm fired up and ready to go. I'm ready. I wish we were, we were on a campaign field to be able to elect an, an, a, a slate of Black women all across the country, um, but I know um, with your leadership, we're gonna see even more diversity among our Democratic candidates, um, and we'll be able to have more activists who are helping to power um, Democratic victories in Congress and legislatures and city councils all across the country. So thank you, thank you for being here, and thank you for your, for your leadership. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and stay safe, please. And talk about not being daunted and amazing women. We have an amazing woman who leads the California Democratic Party Black Caucus. Um, she started off as um, a mother um, who saw injustice happening around her, um, got active in her labor union, um, went from the labor union to seeing that she had to be involved in politics and then got involved in local party politics. And now she, and she's, she's active in many things in San Diego, but one thing that I have the pleasure of working with her very often with is the Black Caucus, which she leads very powerfully and very, um, very ably. She's a, a strong a voice for the Black community up and down the state. Without further ado, 
Um, let me introduce Taisha Brown, the chair of the California Democratic Party Black Caucus. Taisha. Hello, everyone. Um, good evening, and thank you all for joining. I'm going to try to clear up this background. Okay, well, I am chocolate, so it's a little dark, but that's okay. We'll get through it. I want to start off by thanking um, our chair, Rusty Hicks, uh, for even having the thought to do something like this. I really appreciate that. And Vincent for always reaching out to me uh, to make sure that I am included. And to Yvette for being outstanding, always calling me back. And all the staff, Emma, India, um, Unique, all of you, I really appreciate all the work that you do. So good evening, everyone. I am Taisha Brown, the chair of the California Democratic Party Black Caucus. I am honored to, honored to be here with you all tonight to talk about something that's near and dear to me, and that is Black History Month. I truly believe that we all, I truly believe that all people, Black, white, brown, or whatever, are blessed to have a month where we celebrate the achievement of Black Americans. And yet, I also believe that every single month is Black History Month for me. I am a black woman that lives in America, so I feel it every day. Black people help build this country. Though we're not in many of the history books, we help build this country. Black people have carried the weight of this country on our backs. I am unapologetically a black woman that seeks justice for black people in every way possible. And I must say, California and the Democratic Party has not lived up to the fullest potential when it comes to Black people. We can and we must do better. I challenge everyone on this call today to recognize all the history makers in this country that are of African descent. Further, I ask that each one of us commits to educating ourselves more about the Black experience by reading about Black history and slavery, about oppression, about the injustices of Black people, the lashes of hate, and that those of Black people and other allies on this call share with someone that may not know. Sadly, as a Black woman in California seeking a seat to run, it can be extremely challenging. I think Rusty and those of the Democratic Party that have reached out and tried to help. Think about this. How many times are we Black women called upon to do hard work when the Democratic Party needs us? It was mentioned just earlier by our DNC chair how we looked out for Doug Jones. We also have the Nobel Prize nominee, Stacey Abrams, that changed Georgia forever. Our very own Dr. Shirley Weber, who of course is our newly minted Secretary of State. And of course, George Clyburn in South Carolina, who is the highest ranking black person in congressional leadership. I ask you to join me in celebrating black people, not just in February, but every single month. I'll leave you with this one question. If not for Black people, where would the Democratic Party in the United States of America be? Let us reflect on that and demonstrate the clear answer to this question by uplifting not just Black women, but Black people whenever, wherever possible, including and especially here in the California Democratic Party. Thank you all so much for coming out and supporting us. Have a wonderful evening. I pause it.